Hi, everybody. I'm MK Fain. And I'm Sasha White. And this is Identity Crisis. So today we're going to be talking about social contagions among teenage girls. But first, we are going to do our new segment, ICYMI, which stands for In Case You Missed It. And that is when we do one minute wrap ups of current events that we think are important that we want to catch you guys up on in case you may have missed them. ICMY number one in three, two, one, go. The ACLU has filed a lawsuit to prevent a private citizen from receiving public records from the Washington State Department of Corrections on the number of inmates in state custody who are identified who identifies transgender and the number of male inmates who are housed in women's facilities. The woman who's asked to be kept anonymous submitted a public records request, which was then denied after the lawsuit was filed by the ACLU. The ACLU also named members of the press in this lawsuit and are essentially preventing public records that should be released from being released in the name of privacy their clients. Uh, in a very ironic twist, the woman actually claims that she used ACLU resources provided on their website in order to file her public records request. The woman is now being represented by the Women's Liberation Front, and you can donate to their legal action fund to support this lawsuit against the ACLU, who is being completely hypocritical in violating everything that we thought we knew about civil liberties. Very nice. Perfect. And what a crazy story, honestly. So MK, I hope you'll keep us updated on that as we move forward. Yes, of course. Okay, now it is my turn. All right, Sasha, are you ready? In yeah, I'm ready. three, two, one, go. Rob Hoogland was a, is a father in Canada who opposed his daughter's transition when she identified as a trans boy. He was held in contempt of court for speaking to the press about this when the judge imposed a gag order on him. And he his trial is happening right now. And I believe on April 15th, two days ago as of filming, Rob Hoogland was, sen was sentenced to six months in prison. The judge um, imposed this sentence because he decreed that um, contempt of court is an extremely uh, anti-democratic crime to commit and decided to impose this sentence on Rob. Rob is did intentionally go against the gag order and speak to media and online press, including Aaron Brewer, which you can see the interview online. MK and I did an entire episode where we talked about Rob Hoogland, which you can find on our channel. And Rob is a hero and we wish him the best and hope that his prison time goes by not too slowly. Yeah, again, another awful story, but it's, it's really disturbing what's happened with him. But thank you for updating us on that case. Yeah, yeah we wish Rob the best. And we're going to we're going to keep watching his case. Yep. All right. I'll give you your countdown when you're ready. OK, I'm ready. OK, three, two, one, go. At least nine different radical feminist groups were banned from the Chinese social media site Dubin, which is similar to Reddit for our Western listeners. The sites were closed on around April 12th after radical feminists have been uh, growing their movement that's called 6B4T, which is a bar from the Korean radical feminist movement. And it's a movement around the idea of persuading women to turn their backs on heterosexual sex, child rearing, dating, marriage, and all the above with men. Men. The censorship comes in a, a moment of crisis for feminism and women in China who are facing uh, increased rates of violence after the uh, years of the one child policy created a disproportionate number of women and men in China and the great amount of censorship from the CCP as the government tries to uh, increase the number of people marrying and having children now. So we wish our Chinese feminist sisters the best of luck and we're here for you however you can be. Great. Oh, not not very much fun news today from around the no, world. No fun. So today we're gonna talk about uh, something that we experience as teenagers and something that really I think directly relates to the gender identity crisis right now, which is social contagion and mental health among teenage girls specifically. So, um, you know, we both have read Abigail Schreier's Irreversible Damage and uh, it is highly recommend if you haven't read it yet, get it wherever it's not been banned. And she said something in this book that really resonated with both of us. So um, if it's okay, I'm going to go ahead and just read a little quote from this book. Yeah, please do. So she says, this is in the introduction chapter. She says, three decades ago, these girls, girls who are now transgender identifying as trans, 
might have hankered for liposuction with their physical forms wasted away. Two decades ago, today's trans-identified teens might have discovered a repressed memory of childhood trauma. Today's diagnostic craze isn't demonic possession, it's gender dysphoria, and its cure is not exorcism, laxatives, or purging, it's testosterone and top surgery. Um, this is something that when I first read it, it really, you know, it just hit me sideways because I realized, now she actually doesn't mention, she goes three decades ago, two decades ago, but the decade that she leaves out in there, which she then gets into a lot later, is the decade that we were in school when we were middle and high school girls. And for us, the craze was self-harm. And this is something that we both lived through. And um, I think we really kind of see a lot of ourselves in the girls who are going through this gender identity crisis today. Yeah, one thing that jumped out at me when I was reading was a particular statistic that um, in between the years 2009 and 2013, the rate of self-harm increased, I believe, threefold it was. So I'm not looking at the citation in front of me, but I do believe that um, in 2009, the rate of teen girls self-harming began to triple. So when I read this, I just froze. I just stopped because those are the exact years that I was in high school. I started high school in 2009. That's the year I turned 14. And I engaged in self-harm. You know, I cut myself. And it's something that, you know, I just completely got over as I grew out of my teenage years. And those intense, heavy emotions started calming down. And you learn how to deal with them when you do still have intense emotions. But as a young teenager, I did start doing this behavior, which I later learned, you know, I didn't know at the time that this was a social contagion, but now I know. And it's pretty remarkable to learn something like that, you know, when you when you realize you weren't alone in something that you, you were part of a social contagion. It's wild. Yeah, it, it's really crazy. I, I'm not positive, but I'm pretty sure I started self-harming my sophomore or junior year of high school. And so that would have been 2008, 2009. And uh, I same year. Also would not have thought, yeah, like, and, and I also would not have thought that I was part of a social contagion because I didn't think any of my friends were doing it. Like I thought I was the only one of all my friends, but I actually learned about it from a book. There was this series of um, like educational sort of books that were framed as like YA novels about like teenage girls and each book was about a different struggle that a teenage girl is going through and how she overcame it. And it was supposed to be kind of motivational, but I picked up the series and started reading on the book about self-harm. And I guess I really related to the character in the book because I had never heard of self-harm before cutting. Um, but what she was doing seemed like an interesting thing worth trying to see if it could help me. And it was something that was accessible to me. Like I was never really around drugs or alcohol. And, you know, I was having so many feelings and emotions. And I was in this like really toxic relationship that was I mean, on and off, just awful. And, and I hated my body. I hated myself. I just like was not a happy kid. And so I was looking for some way to like channel all of this. And then this book, basically introduced the concept of self-harm to me, I started doing it and continued actually now that you mention it until about 2013, which is really insane to think of. But yet I feel like I didn't really know anyone else in high school who was doing it. Yeah. I mean, it's funny because I first heard the first time I ever heard of self-harm was in class <laughs> when they were trying to teach us mm. about like, it was like health class or whatever in middle school. It was probably 2008 eight or maybe you know early 2009 and um they they were teaching us about like anorexia the pro anna nation which is was this online community and i didn't know about any of this stuff and i do think that there's i have a serious critique with them bringing that stuff into the classroom you know i think there is a place for it to talk about these issues and to educate kids about these issues and other issues but looking back I wonder about the helpfulness of them teaching us about this stuff. And, you know, then I, I'm naturally curious. So I went home and I started looking at the pro animation and I started reading those blogs. Luckily, I didn't have a problem with starving myself, but I was intrigued by it. And I did read them, you know, enough that I could, could tell you about what, what it was like on there. Um, and so then, and, and then I learned about, you know, cutting and self-harm. And so then a few months later when my teenage hormones started getting really intense and my emotions got intense and you know some stuff some friendships fell apart and i was just like really emotional about it that was what i went to it was kind of like with you i thought i'll try this
And so it, it's it's something that I only just realized recently when I, I couldn't remember when I had first heard of cutting, you know, and I just realized it recently. Um, but how, so why are we talking about this, you know, other than just oversharing online? Um, what's, what's the relevance of this? You know, we're now both in our 20s. We are, I think, overall healthy, happy women. And like we both said, we grew out of this. Um, it's something that we're completely 100% able to leave in the past. You know, we can talk about it. We don't, you know, I don't really have a lot of emotional attachment to it anymore. It's not, it, it's not painful for me to talk about it. I'm, I'm past it. You know, that was me when I was a kid. But today's social contagion is a prison if you follow it too far, right? So that's kind of what we want to yeah. talk about. Yeah, absolutely. I, I really relate to what you said about being able to grow out of it. Um, it's pretty much the same thing that happened with me. And it wasn't a, you know, it wasn't just 100%. I just got older, aged, and then it stopped. But as I got older, I started to learn things about how to take care of my mental health. I started going to therapy and, and like learned how to handle these emotions. And I learned, you know, these tricks to mature. And I, and but maturing is what enabled me to really actually use these tips and to seek out therapy to actually get help and to want to, you know, improve the way that I, I was living in my conditions. Um, and, but you're right now today, the kids who are going through today's generation, social contagion, gender identity, um, or gender dysphoria, or rapid onset gender dysphoria, whatever version uh, applies, they are instead of allowed to heal and, you know, given help when they need it and then grow out of it when they mature and get older and find better ways to cope with their uh, emotions and problems. They're instead being put on hormones and surgeries and, and all of these lifelong changes that cannot be undone, that are irreversible. And that's what's really disturbing. And I think a lot about how if I were forced by my mistakes to still live with what I was going through as a teenager, how damaging that would be for the rest of my life. And, you know, to a small degree, I actually do still live with that. Um, I actually, I do still have some scars on my arm from when I self-harmed and I, it's, they're really faint. I don't really think about it that much, but I do have a little bit of a permanent reminder right there on my body of this is what I was going through as a kid. And it feels so weird to me, like alien, like that, like I'm such a different person now than I was when I was 16, 15 going through this stuff. And to think that what if instead of, you know, a couple lines on my arm, I had removed entire body parts or I had injected myself with drugs that my body wasn't made for and, and changed my features permanently. You know, that's not something I can wear a long sleeve to cover up. Um, mm -hmm. And it is, it's really sad to think about what it must be like to be stuck then 10 years later in, in your essential, like the, the decisions that you made as a teenager. Right. And I mean, you know, when you say 10 years later, it's like, yeah, 10 years later, but then 20 years later, 30 years later, 50 years later, you know, and that's, that's something that I think about sometimes is like the decades that these kids are going to have to live with whatever changes were brought about in their bodies. And, um, you know, puberty is, it's pretty rough, right? Like it's not easy for most people, especially for girls. Okay. I don't want to, I take that back because I just, I don't know exactly. I don't want to make a comparison, but I know it's hard for girls, for, for very many girls. It's insanely hard. But listen, we all know there's no way out but through, right? That's the thing. That is just right. human truth. There is no way out but through. And a lot of kids have like Peter Pan syndrome. I don't know if you ever had this MK, but I did. I was just afraid to grow up. I wanted to be a kid forever. I had, you know, a little touch of Peter Pan syndrome. So even though I didn't have any kind of gender problems, you know, maybe was also a result of the times. Um, I do think that I would have been allured by the idea of not going through puberty because I didn't want to. Yeah. It was scary. It was terrifying to me. So I, I do, I understand that. And 
Also, just to say, one of the reasons we wanted to make this video this week was a follow-up to our last episode when we talked about our, the Arkansas bill that did go through, by the way, update, we should update our viewers in case they didn't know. The Arkansas bill, it was actually vetoed by the governor, but then the um, assembly pushed it through, the state assembly, I believe. So it is going to be law now in Arkansas that doctors cannot give uh, puberty blockers, hormones, cross-sex hormones, or gen you know, gender surgeries to minors in Arkansas. So it's really big news. And you know, we talked about the bill from a very legal, analytical standpoint, but we wanted to approach it a little more from a human perspective this time and talk about what it's like to be a teenage girl and why we understand what's what's happening with these girls, but we also see it from the perspective of big pharma wants to make money and doctors want to try new things and parents don't know what to do. And um, I mean, yeah, what do you think of that MK, that whole you know, going through puberty fucking sucks, but then you get through it, right? Instead of like, yeah. what? what's the, is there like an analogy here of um, something that we could compare to where you really don't want to go through something, but then your solution may, means that you'll never get through to the other side? Because that's what puberty blockers are. Yeah. I mean, it, it's anything hard in life, really. I mean, it's doing, it's it's writing that essay that you have to write. And like, it's so annoying to do, but if you don't do it, then your life is only going to get harder. You're only going to have to repeat the class. And then like, then you have to write even more essays. So isn't that worse? And like, just sit yeah. down and do it and then it's done. I mean, it's the same as, oh, you want to like get more in fit then you have to actually go to the gym, go work out. I never do this, but that's what you're supposed to do. <laughs> the only way through to, to get to where you wanna be it is to just go through it. Like there's no shortcuts there in life. You can't just skip the whole hard part, like the hard work. And in growing up that like actually growing through it is the hard part and it, it does suck. Um, for me, I wasn't really scared of puberty because I was actually a late bloomer. And so all of my friends had gone through it before me and I felt like I wasn't keeping up. Like I still looked like a 12 year old when my friends looked like 16 year olds. And so I felt bad about myself because I felt like I like couldn't compete for the attention of boys essentially, which you know was like everything as a teenage girl. And I wanted to look more like um, my friends who I thought were much more beautiful than me. And so I really struggled with hating my body, not be, not in like a gender dysphoric way, almost the opposite. Like I didn't feel like I was womanly enough. Like my boobs were too small. Like so, someone once called them mosquito bites. And like, I never forgot that. Like when I was a kid and you know, my nose was too big, my forehead was too big. Someone told me I have a five head, not a forehead. And like, never forgot that one. And like, you know, these things, they just like stick in your head. And uh, I was really self-conscious about my skin still to this day I am. And so yeah, puberty sucks because yeah. everything is changing. But for me, it was also just being so full of self-doubt and literally everything of having all of these emotions, not understanding what to do with them, not understanding where they were going or, or where they were coming from and not having any real way to actually like cope with them, like no productive coping mechanisms or outlets and um, and not really having the support system that was prepared to help me through in a meaningful way. But I, again, you you do the hard work and you get through it. And I did, like I did the hard work of growing up and, and you know, actually put some more intentional work in through, you know, seeking professional help and really put a lot of effort into taking care of myself. And now uh, I'm really proud of who I am. And I think that is, it, it's really hard to imagine though when you're in it, because yeah, when you're in it, you can't see the future. You just see where you're at now. And you don't, you don't have that sense of perspective when you're a kid. We just, yeah. we know this. And it, it really illustrates how hard puberty is because you just talked about, you know, your experience, which is also very common. And I know it's shared by a lot of girls. I had something a little more on the other end of the spectrum where, like I said, I was scared to go through puberty and grow up. And for me, I didn't want those changes to happen. It's quite, mm -hmm. well, you know, I had mixed feelings about it. I did want yeah. to get boobs, but, um, <laughs> I remember when my hips started growing, I thought that I was fat suddenly. And I know that happens with a lot of girls. And um, 
if you know if if there was an option presented to me to arrest that process it's possible that i would have taken it it doesn't help that the beauty standards of our society are you know well and this has changed too but when we were in high school it was this it was the rail thin was the beauty standard mm -hmm. so having curves wasn't exactly even the beauty standard that it is today where thick is uh seen as the hottest body type right <laughs> But only in a very specific format, like if you don't look like a Kardashian yeah. or a Jenner and you don't have Instagram face, then yeah. I mean, now I think it's even so much more work to try to look a certain way because now there's like, I feel like Instagram is and TikTok and like all of these like real like visual beauty elements, YouTube uh, have really made the like visual pressure on girls even so much worse today. And so of course girls feel like shit about their bodies. Like they're changing every minute. You can't keep up with what's happening. Everyone around you is changing at a different pace. And society is telling you that you're supposed to look and act and feel a certain way. And if you don't, then there must be something wrong with you. So no wonder girls think that there's something wrong with them. And every generation has their version of this. But like you said, today's generation is going through a version of it that's a lot more ultimately harmful because they're not going to be allowed to grow out of it. And what bothers me is that the parents don't stop. I, I have a hard time with this because I don't want to blame parents and I don't want to judge them or speak of what I don't know because I'm not a parent. But I know that my parents let me grow up and they didn't, you know, I don't know, put me on medication, antidepressants, or, which in some cases is proper, perhaps not in my case. Um, but you know, we need that room to, to just get through it. Like it's going to be rough, but uh, for parents and Schreier really emphasized this in her book. She thinks they're being like helicopter parents, right? Like they're doing too much. Just let them grow up. Remember when you were a kid, like, I guess what we could end with is how good it feels when you start getting out of that phase. I mean, the teenage years can be so hard. And for me, it was when I turned 18 that things started to get better and I started to feel more comfortable with myself and be able to, you know, carry myself in a more confident way. And just everything lightened up. You know what I mean? It just lightened up. I was so dark as a teen. I was so like I would ruminate on things. I would create problems that weren't there. By the way, I was going to I was going to mention that because that's something that we see with the gender dysphoria where with the ROGD, you have yeah. such strong emotions and you don't know how to deal with them and teenagers do look for problems or create problems that aren't there and if you just persevere and endure things will lighten up and if they don't then there's another problem that you can deal with once you're an adult yeah uh, you know okay i'm gonna maybe say a little bit of the opposite here but i uh, what's popping into my mind is from harry potter what dumbledore says to harry is uh just because it's in your head doesn't mean it's not real and it, that's so interesting because it's not true. Like, you know, you can, you can have, you know, hallucinations or thoughts that are not accurate, or you can think something that's not true, but that what I think I take out of that, that really I relate to as a younger, uh, as a teen is that you can be feeling something and it can feel very real to you. And maybe it isn't actually real. Like I really relate to what you just said about like making up problems and like finding things. Uh, when I was younger, I was really obsessed with fantasy. I think it's like kind of a longer story, but I think it comes from my very religious upbringing and then never really being taught how to separate uh, fantasy from reality. And so when I moved away from Christianity, I got very into fantasy stuff. And so, I mean, until I was way too old for this to be appropriate, I was like kind of finding like magical things, you know, like I would have these like really, really strong emotions about something and think that I was having some sort of like magical sense of like a feet, like a premonition or, you know, some sort of like experience that meant something on like some sort of spiritual level or, you know, kind of mystical sort of energy stuff. And I think that that's a very similar thing that is super common among teenagers is you find you know, you have all these strong emotions, you don't have any coping skills, and like you probably don't have people around you who are really like encouraging healthy behaviors because, you know, you're lucky if you do. And then you have all this magical thinking and you're searching for this like 
really big story that like explains everything about what you're going through. You know, you're, you're the protagonist in your story. And normally when we have protagonists, they have like, there's a reason that they're going through everything they're going through. And then there's like some like magical thing that solves it. And when I was younger, I was really looking for those sorts of things as well. And you're, you're absolutely right. Getting older. I mean, it's, it's hard to say because when you're there, it is, really real and when you get older it will feel less real but when it feels real i think that what's important to remember is that there are like ways that you can cope with these things and there are i think it's just having like an understanding of this is just what i'm going through right now this is not my forever this is not my permanent like this is not my long-term reality this is just what i'm feeling right now so i think that that i guess would be my my message to the younger me yeah. is, you know, it, it's not real, but I know that it feels real for you. And here are some better ways that you can handle these things instead of harming yourself. And I think that that's a lot of what's lacking in our communication to kids today. We try to make a, you know, my solution for you is going to be this like permanent life altering change that's going to set the course of your life instead of here's the thing that you can handle this temporary feeling in a temporary way. Yeah, and I really like what you said about the fantasy because in the sort of classic hero's journey story, which is one of the oldest parts of culture and civilization, is this idea that you receive a call, the call, and then you're special, so you get this call, and then that begins your adventure, and you get to go into, you get to travel into this other world, right, out of the home, the realm of the home, the home and hearth and into this world of adventure where you are special and you have some reason for being there. And um, I, I wonder if that plays a part in this in this gender transition. It's like, oh, this is the, oh, I have dysphoria. I'm, I'm born in the wrong body. I have to go on this journey, this transition journey. And that's what I'm mm -hmm. being called to do. And there's a very specialness that you feel when you're doing some, I know that when I was self-harming, it was like, it was my little special little yes. secret. And if you are doing that, it's like, it's not always realistic of us to say, just stop. Um, but realize that it's, how can I say this? That, um, that you don't need that to be your special you. Like that's just right. something you're doing. That's not who you are. And, and I think that we really do when we're younger look for this, Thing that's so special that it can't just be like I am me living my life and like becoming the person I'm going to be and now in hindsight like I did have a hero's journey you know I went through uh problems and then there were solutions and now I am here and you know my life continues to be my own personal hero's journey as everyone's life is for themselves um but as you start to, you know, have more experiences, you don't need something like kind of fantastical or magical or, or uh, like made up in order to feel like you're special because you start to find the things about you, you know, you start to solidify your identity after, I mean, the teenage years are known for identity exploration and, and identity crisis. <laughs> um, so being able to come through that, know who you are, then helps you go on your like I'm special magical heroes journey just on your own without needing anything extra to make it special. Cause you're just, your life is yours and that is special. Probably also as a reminder, we are not mental health professionals. And if you are struggling with any of these issues, we really highly encourage you to seek proper mental health from a professional. And I will probably throw up some resources on the screen. So if you need help, please do seek it. And we're not your therapist. We have new episodes every Monday. You can find us here on YouTube or wherever you get your podcasts. And check out MK's corresponding column on 4W. See you next week.